So today, one of my um, students for my VIP mentorship, my coaching program, um, was in town. So I took him, we went and did a workout. We filmed a couple of exercises. So I wanted to give you guys an example of what a real set to failure looks like. There's a lot of confusion that people, for one reason or another, Oh, one set, that can't be enough. Well, watch how this set is done. <laughs> so I'm going to show you what failure looks like. And if you're not trying to replicate what you're going to see here in the gym, you're going to be leaving results on the table. I'm going to show you, you know, how I, I take a client to failure. And you're going to see what it really means to deeply erode and fatigue a muscle. And if you do it this way, Make sure my audio is right. And if you do it like this, you couldn't possibly tolerate high volume, volume, or high frequency. You couldn't. And you'll also be able to see why a set performed this way is more effective. All right. I mean, theoretically, you could take, you know, you know, you could take five sets to, to, to you know, go to failure. But... I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what a real set to failure looks like. I'm going to show you me taking one of my students through a set. Um, did I put the link? Let me see. And if you and if you're interested in joining my VIP group, um, you know it's lifetime access to me as your coach. Um, and we do two group calls a week. I teach you absolutely everything. Let me see if I can find this. And also as part of my VIP coaching, um, we're going to, we're going to do virtual training sessions. So I'm going to take you through, oh, does this not have any, hold on one second. I'm just like. Fucked up all over the place today. All right, we need this. Right here, copy. One idiot. One idiot. So if you guys want to learn how to do this properly and you want me to guide you through, and also I've been doing virtual training sessions uh, with the people in my in my coaching group. During our group call, if you have a home gym, Put a camera up and I'll talk you through an entire workout start to finish. I'll train you in front of the other students and everybody gets value from that. So that's what we did yesterday. And uh, at about 1 p.m., I'm posting a video of that so you can see what it's like. So, you know, you join the VIP group. Um, you're going to get um, you're going to get some uh, training, too. Let me edit this description. Make sure. So there's a, a link in the description. And I'll post it here too to uh, learn more about the VIP group. Here's the link. And with this, you know, we'll do some virtual training sessions. Um, you'll learn everything. I'll talk you through everything. And it's just, there's a lot to learn. So if you want to learn more, that's what you're going to want to do. Also, again, home workout is free golden era. So I'm going to show you a true set to failure on Nautilus Nitro. So let me explain something interesting about Nautilus Nitro. Let me just, if I do this, does it get bigger? No, it does not. Okay. So you guys see where my cursor is. This is called a cam. And what the cam does is it changes the length of the moment arm the length between the load and the axis of rotation. So right here, you can see is the axis of rotation. The distance between that and the cam, the longer the distance, the more resistance, the shorter the distance, the less resistance. So as you'll see throughout this range of motion, as I take fill through, your, your lats are weaker in the extended position. 
So Nautilus equipment is designed to shorten, see the distance between the Kevlar belt and the axis of rotation is shorter here. There's also what's called a counterweight. So what it does is it shifts, it, it changes the moment arm of the counterweight, the position of the counterweight and the position of the cam to make the load lighter up here as it should be. If the resistance does not vary in these exercises, you'll notice you'll reach sticking points. So that's why Nautilus, Nautilus Nitro are extremely effective. So ideally, if you're doing a pullover, this is why a dumbbell pullover does not work because it does not vary the resistance properly. You'll notice in the length and position where the lats are extended, when the arms are extended, um, arms down is flexion. So when the, when the lats are extended, you're getting less load right here. It's going to have the most load somewhere towards the middle of the range of motion. Watch. So you'll notice in the middle right here, this is where the lats are about the strongest in terms of the actin myosin overlap um, and just the overall strength curve. But you'll notice here, well, you can't really see it. But you'll notice in this middle position, look where the counterweight is. Do you see the counterweight behind his left biceps? The counterweight is parallel with the floor, meaning it is producing the longest moment arm between the counterweight and the axis of rotation. So right here, the counterweight in the cam position is adding resistance in this middle part of the range of motion. It's making it heavier right here in order to challenge the strongest position of the range of motion. So the counterweight parallel with the floor in the strongest position, adding more resistance. Now, when we go back up to extension, counterweight is lower, shortening the moment arm, shortening the distance between the counterweight and the axis of rotation in order to reduce resistance in the stretch position. This is why these machines are brilliant. So, and now we're going to go to the fully contracted position. Boom. Now in the fully contracted position, you're weaker again. So when a muscle is fully lengthened, passive insufficiency, less strength, less force. Somewhere in the middle, optimum actinomycin overlap, your muscles are strongest somewhere in the middle. Exactly where, who the fuck knows? Somewhere in the middle. Then as you start to contract again, due to bunching up or bending of the titan and the actinomycin filaments in your muscles, they, are, they produce less force. That's why you get that cramping sensation. The titan and, and the filaments and actinomycin start to bend and kind of bunch up, and you get that cramping sensation. That's why you're weaker. Notice, look, the, the length between the cam and the axis of rotation is very short. It's going to reduce resistance in this position again. Notice the position of the counterweight. Straight up and down. Zero moment arm between the counterweight and the axis of rotation. What's that going to do? Reduce the resistance. So this machine is perfectly designed in order to reduce resistance in the contracted position where it should, load the most in the mid-range, and reduce resistance again in the extended position. This is why you want to use well-designed machines. If it were, if it were not varying the resistance throughout the range of motion, what would happen is you would go to change direction and just get stuck right here. And you'd think you reached failure, but you didn't. You just reach a sticking point. The load is too heavy for that particular part of the range of motion. So we're going to see that when Phil reaches failure, he's going to reach failure in the mid range. He's going to get stuck in the strongest position. That's how you know it is true muscle failure. Most individuals who are going just doing whatever exercises, whatever machines, you might be getting stuck and, uh, and being like, okay, that's failure. But it is not failure due to adequate muscle fatigue. It is a sticking point or mechanical failure. Okay, so this is why Nautilus machines are the best. There are ways around this. Um, 
you know, but but in general, if you have a gym that has access to Nautilus Nitro machines, even if it's a further drive, even if it's inconvenient, use them. They're out there. It's just, you know, finding them is sometimes tough. But I think, you know, a lot of uh, I've seen like Sport of Fitness or uh, LA Fitness, you know, sometimes I have them. Hammer strength varies your resistance too, but I'll, I'll show you that some other time. So we're going to watch a full set to failure. I wonder if, oh shit. Oh, let me try it again. I want to make sure the audio is being shared. All right. So this is going to be a full set to failure. He overestimated the weight. Uh, keep in mind, meta analysis are absolutely fucking pointless because they can be um, well, okay. There isn't going to be a difference in improvement, of course not, between using free weights or variable resistance machines. As long as you're training really fucking hard, the results are going to be the same. This is going to be more efficient. It's just better, okay? Like, a Mercedes S class versus a bentley continental they're both nice they're both going to get you from a to b but if you have the option all else being equal you're going to pick the bentley continental are you not not that you're going to get from a to b in any different fashion you're going to get there more comfortably <laughs> so um you know comparing like free weights or hammer strength to, to nautilus or Menex is like comparing an s-class mercedes to a bentley continental yeah they're, they're very similar but if you have the option, pick the Bentley Continental, pick the Nautilus Nitro. You're telling me you wouldn't go out of your way a little bit for a Bentley Continental? Of course you would. Of course. Prefer Toyota. Well, yeah, we all, to each their own. Um, all right, let's see. Let's watch Phil go through a full workout or a full set. Yeah, we kind of overestimated the weight here. All right. I got the audio kind of low. You don't really need to hear all that much. All right, so we're starting here. When you're doing this exercise, you want to be driving through the elbows and simply resting your hand on the bar. You do not want to be pulling the bar down. You want to be pushing through your elbows. Range of motion does not need to be huge. It's going to change direction around, about there. You'll notice this is just rep two. Rep two is pretty difficult. You want to select a weight. Where by the time you get to rep three and four, it's fucking hard. You don't want to breeze through eight reps and then uh, and then failure. No, you want it to be tough from start to finish. This is about 125 pounds. The weight stack probably goes up to about 220, I would say. 125 is not light for this machine. I do about 170. Look, he's contracting as hard as he can right now that's like rep five that's not failure remember most of you would probably stop there this is when the exercise begins we're going to push through that maintaining slow control now he's going to be contracting as hard as he can it's barely going to move but it's still moving contract 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 boom he's not done He's not done. This is when the exercise begins, guys. This is when most people stop and they say, oh, I trained to failure. And uh, uh, one set isn't enough. No, we're still going. Look at that. I'm pretending to help him. I'm not really helping him. It's a psychological thing. I've noticed over training 20,000 sessions, if I simply put my hand on the machine, people will tend to work harder. Now I'm going to give him a little assistance. He's contracting as hard as he possibly freaking can right now. It's barely moving. I'm giving them just enough to get through and contract. Now he's pulling it in for five seconds. Four, three, two. And then I'm going to torture him a little more. When you get to this point, you feel like borderline death. Well, he saw Jesus. <laughs> so that, um, do you count? The reps when you help? No. 
So if I were to track reps or track time under load, if I'm you know watching him with a stopwatch, I'm timing him until he reaches positive concentric failure. As soon as he complete, comes to a complete stop and cannot move anymore, stopwatch is hit, and I'm recording that time. The additional repetitions are just to, to try to inroad a little more. This was his first time using this machine. So with that in mind, he could have gotten stuck due to different reasons because he's not really used to it. So I'm going to push him a little further past past failure. Um, let's see. So that was the pullover. I'm going to show um, myself doing the pullover as well. He gave me some assistance on it too. I want to show you what it, what it means to really, really, really push hard. That's not the right one. I want to stop screen. All right. All right, I'm going to show you how I take a set to failure, okay? Start slowly. Just take your time. You're just contracting your muscle against resistance. Pause in the contract position. Ease out. You cannot do this exercise without a seatbelt. If this, if you have one of these machines and it doesn't have a seatbelt, don't even fucking bother. Contract. Ease out. I'm concentrated on breathing. I'm concentrating on keeping the muscles loaded. I don't give a shit what the weight is doing. I'm using the weight, using the apparatus to load the lats. Squeeze and contract, ease out. Always breathing. Breathe freely and continuously. Do not hold your breath. It's going to start to get really tough right here. What am I doing? I'm breathing more. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Boom. I'm driving my elbows through the pads and holding. This is not failure yet. We got more. These reps are absolutely fucking brutal. And I'm going to continue to do them until I feel like I'm borderline dead. Shaking, contracting, still contracting. This is failure. You thought that was failure. Nope. We're doing another. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have him give me a little more resistance just to get into that contracted position. Then I'm gonna hold it there for a little more torture, and then very slowly ease it down, keeping them loaded, keeping them loaded. Boom! Now that is a set to failure, and when you get done with that set, there is literally no way you could do another. This is why it's pointless to do more sets. The growth stimulus has been triggered in that one set. Exactly. That's it. The goal is we're, we're trying to smash the button. We're turning on the button. All right. How do we turn on this button? How do we turn on this growth stimulus? Well, the research is showed by stimulating the mTOR pathway. The mTOR pathway is stimulated by a high amount of um, mechanical tension by more or less turning on the costumeers and the mechanosensors. They send a downstream biochemical reaction. So if we create a ton of tension, it contract really, really hard. The costumeers and mechanosensors kind of turn on a, a downstream biochemical reaction that reaches the nucleus and then reaches the mTOR pathway. And then the other way we do this is um, through uh, metabolite production. And if you're pushing your body really, really hard and putting a heavy demand on the muscles to produce force, the muscles need to produce ATP to produce that tension and produce that force. Where does your body get ATP from? ATP is the uh, energy currency the body uses to produce actinomycin, um, well, 
to release the actin and myosin and bind the actin and myosin comes from glucose, comes from sugar. Sugar goes, glucose goes through metabolism, produces ATP, cause the actin and myosin cross bridging to occur. If we need more tension, we need more actin and myosin cross bridging. Therefore, the metabolism is run harder and then we get the metabolic byproducts. Okay. Um, you know, ideally, again, you ideally, this is, you know, a fucking awesome machine to work your lats. Um, doesn't mean other machines don't. A pull down will be just as effective. But uh, again, the pull down is going to include your biceps. Um, for instance, you know, when I train my dog, I get bicep tendonitis like crazy. So sometimes I don't want to go in there and incorporate flexion, elbow flexion with back exercises, which this, this helps. All right, let's see. That's hard. The first time I did slower moving, people at my gym thought it was not okay. <laughs> yeah. I remember one time I, I was training legs and I couldn't really walk after. And a guy came up to me. He was like, you all right, man? I was like, yeah, I just trained my legs. <laughs> like you should, If you're training legs, you shouldn't be able to walk properly after. You should be. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you uh, the hip belt squat too. Yeah. Yeah, when people call my system a scam. I don't know. I'm not forcing anybody. You can use your own mind. You don't have to follow it, you know. I don't know what's a scam about it, but I don't give a shit what you guys do. I'm just trying to show you the best way to do this. At the end of the day, it's up to you. You can do you can do volume. You can do cross. I don't care what you do. I'm just trying to show you the best way I found to do it. All right. Um I'm going to show you guys a technique that I use and that I will be uploading into my golden era system for other muscle groups. Okay. This is a technique I don't show anybody. It's kind of like my little secret, but I'm going to show you guys a good shoulder training technique. Okay. This is one of the most effective training techniques you can ever use. And I'm giving it to you for free because I am a scam artist. Okay. So what we're going to do, notice this machine has slack. So what I've done here is I've created slack in the machine. See, boom, boom, boom. So sometimes you'll notice machines have a little slack. Now, if you gap the machine stack, As you can see, see, there's a gap right here. This is called gapping the stack. So essentially what you do is you pull the pin all the way out. And then you grab the handles and position the handles where you want your starting range of motion to be. So I'll pull the pin out, put the handles up, then select my weight. And what you've done is you've gapped the stack and produced and created a different starting position. This is extremely good for a lot of overhead press machines because you don't want to be starting an overhead press machine here. You don't want to be starting a chest press machine here. You want to be starting a chest press machine here, an overhead press machine here. So gapping the stack, as you see here, is it, you can do it on any selectorized piece of equipment and change the starting position, which is going to make the exercise safer. Now, when you gap the stack, you're going to be left with some slack in the machine because the weight is not engaged. The Kevlar belt is going to be loose. So what we've got is, as you see in the beginning, there's a little bit of slack. See that? That slack? See the Kevlar belt moving? Okay. So what we're going to do with this technique is we're going to do a couple of hard repetitions. And this is going to be a rest pause technique, a kind of um, advanced rest pause technique. So as you guys know, the rest pause, we set the weight down, we wait another repetition. Okay. We, we generally completely relax in between repetitions with rest pause, but with this, we do not. What we're going to do is in between rest pause repetitions, he's going to simply take the slack out of the machine. Basically, if the handles were hooked up to nothing, they would weigh a few pounds, five pounds maybe. Basically, what he's going to be doing in between our rest pause technique is simply holding the handles up, just the weight of the handles. 
and then perform another repetition. And we are going to repeat this until his shoulders explode. And if you guys do this on an overhead press exercise, you will feel the most ridiculous stimulus in your shoulders that you've ever felt in your life. Okay. I generally don't show this, but I'm gonna. All right. So we're going to watch the whole set from start to finish. Okay. So in between, he's going to do four or five repetitions. Choose a weight where you do four or five repetitions close to failure. You don't have to go to failure. And then we're going to do rest pause. But in our breaks in between repetitions, we're going to hold that slack out of the machine. And this is going to keep the slow twitch motor units just enough engaged to where they cannot recover. So he's going to do a couple repetitions, slowly and controlled. Do you think rear delts are worth training? No, I don't. Small muscle group. So these are, you know, it's only 65 pounds, but on a Nautilus Nitro overhead press machine, when you're doing these controlled, 65 pounds is a lot. I only train with 80 on this. I, you know, I've trained thousands and thousands and thousands of sessions on this exact Nautilus Nitro overhead press, and I've had nobody do more than 80, no matter how strong they are. All right, so he's going to go one more here. He's going to inroad his shoulders pretty good. And then we're going to begin this advanced rest pause technique. Now, he's going to hold the slack up for 10 seconds. Now his muscles are just enough engaged to hold those handles up. He's not working very hard. He's just kind of holding the handles up, not letting them rest. Then he's going to go for another repetition, and it's going to get fucking hard. Now, here's the next rest pause. Hold the slack out for an additional 10 seconds. It's not heavy, but it keeps the low order motor units just enough engaged to where it sucks. 10 seconds, and then another repetition. Now they're going to get progressively more difficult. Boom. He's going to do it again. He's going to hold the slack out for 10 seconds. Now, look, it's difficult for him to even hold the damn handles up now. His muscles are so destroyed. But we're going again. I'm giving him some assisted reps on this. Now he's going to hold it for five seconds. One more. He's going to continue to try to hold the handles up, even though he barely has enough strength to hold the handles up that weigh five pounds. And then I'm going to assist him through one more full, slow, controlled repetition. And done. That is an extremely effective technique to train your shoulders. I highly recommend you go try this at the gym. You could do it with a life fitness, a matrix, doesn't matter what overhead press you use. You can do this with them and your shoulders will feel a sensation that you have never felt before in your life. Try it. If you have lagging shoulders, whatever, just try this. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh. Secrets to shoulder growth is what I showed you. Try it. All right, let's see. Um, I've got some other ones I want to show you. We've got the row here. We're going to look at a row to failure. And again, you know, uh, how to perform all these exercises like this. It's in the Golden Era system. If you haven't gotten the Golden Era system yet, freaking get it. Shows you exactly how to do all this. And um, I, either I'll put these advanced techniques in the Golden Era system. I'm probably going, I'm going to put a demonstration of that shoulder technique in the Golden Era system. Um so that way people can watch it over and over and over again and, and figure out how to do it. All right. Uh, let me share. All right. So the last one we're going to show is how to a proper set of uh, compound row to failure. This is kind of a bizarre um, hammer strength machine. I like it. Now, 
Let's look at hammer strength machines. Why are hammer strength machines awesome? Variable resistance, okay? Now, if you're in my VIP coaching group, um, I, we will, I teach you about moment arms and leverage and things like that. But just bear with me if you don't know about moment arms and levers and all that. Um, just bear with me here. So why this exercise is awesome is the difference in the moment arm. The axis of rotation is here. You see my mouse? The axis of rotation is here. The distance between the axis of rotation and the load, which is going to be this plate, obviously, is called the moment arm. For instance, if I have a dumbbell and I hold it in here versus extend my arm and hold it out here, the dumbbell feels heavier now, doesn't it? The longer the moment arm, the more resistance produced, and in this case, on the working muscle. So this machine is designed in a way to where you are in the extended position. Notice the distance is shortened. So this bar goes down, shortening the moment arm between the axis of rotation and the load, reducing the resistance. Now, like I said, your muscles are the strongest somewhere in the mid-range of the range of motion. So when we're in the mid-range, look at the length of the moment arm. The moment arm is the longest in the mid-range. Let me see if I could get a... The moment arm is the longest in the mid-range where you want the most resistance. He's actually kind of towards the contracted position here. This, this would be the mid-range. This is where you want the most resistance. Well designed. Again, as you reach a more contracted position due to actinomycin excessive overlap, you're going to have less contractile force. And look what happens to the moment arm. Oops. Now he's in the fully contracted position. Look, the moment arm shortens again, thereby reducing resistance again on the working muscle. So these hammer strength machines are very good. They are designed to vary the resistance by changing, by using counterweights, changing the moment arm. So this works well. You do not get this moment arm change with dumbbells and barbells. That's why these machines are a little better. Okay. So this is why hammer strength is good. All right, we're going to watch the full set here. Again, neutral grip for rows is ideal. You really don't want a pronated grip. Look at, look at the guy in the back just banging him out, and he quit. All right, guys, okay. <laughs> I'm not – I don't mean to pick on him. I don't mean to pick on him, but – the guy in the back is an example of why people are spending so much fucking time in the gym in making it inefficient. Let's look at this guy in the back. Let's look at his entire set. Ready? One. Or no, he starts up top. Here we go. One. Two. Guy in the back. Three. Yeah. He did three reps and he quit. Not really sure what that was. This is how most people train, guys. And, of course, if you're doing what that guy in the back did, you're going to have to do a lot more sets and a lot more exercises. Of course you are. What did he even just do? He just kind of moved. One, yeah. that, and then he quit. That's not going to do anything. Come on. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to, to logically figure out that. <laughs> what the fuck that was? I thought he was going to actually do a full set, but no, he just did three reps and he fucking hightailed right out of there. So look at the guy in the back set. Yeah, it's starting to get tough. Okay, I'm done. Now let's look at this set. <laughs> Come on, guys. This isn't rocket science. It's, it's evident why higher intensity training is more effective. What's he even doing? Let me go change his music. Now notice how he is not fully extending. He's going to hold the contracted position a little bit. Boom. He's going to unsqueeze gently. Notice his body ain't swinging either. He's going to avoid full extension. And he's coming back. And this guy in the back is just going to rep out, you know, a couple reps again. And then just, I, I don't know what the fuck he's going to do. He's holding his breath. Oh, we did four this time. Now 
Oh, it's the guy in the back of his face is beat red, probably because he's holding his goddamn breath the whole time. You didn't reach failure, that's for sure. All right, so now this is getting real tough. Now I'm pretending to kind of help Phil. I'm not helping him. Squeeze and contract. Now here I might give him an assisted rep. He's going to, this is failure. Guys, notice, notice where failure is. Where is failure? Look at the moment arm. A machine is well designed when you are reaching momentary muscle failure in a position where the muscle is the strongest. The muscle is, is the strongest in this position. The load, he's reaching failure in the right position. Because he's reaching failure. Yeah, when you have that face. <laughs> he's reaching failure in the perfect position. He's getting the most load in the mid-range. And he's reaching failure in the mid-range. So with a lot of these hammer strength pieces, you're going to reach failure in the correct position. You'll notice on all these, and, and with the Nautilus too, everyone's going to reach failure in the mid-range position where actin myosin overlap is the greatest, is the most and the highest. And you're getting um, the most contractile force out of the targeted muscle group. So I'm going to have him continue to pull in. So he's going to reach failure, but I'm going to torch him a little bit. All right. He really hit failure here. Now I'm going to put him in this position, and I'm going to have him gradually contract backwards, not necessarily try to move it, not necessarily try to stop the weight from moving, but get stuck and then kind of gradually contract backwards to keep the muscles engaged. I'm going to have him do this until his muscles completely fail. And then have them lower slowly. Never just drop the weight. Boom. So Phil, st he started skinny. He was skinny. He's gained about 15 pounds since joining my VIP group. Look at his arms. So if you guys are stuck, you're going to want to work with me directly. And I'm going to teach you all this stuff in person. Join the VIP group. I have the link in the description below. So start to finish, let's see the whole set. Notice the first couple are challenging, but they're not easy. You don't want the first couple reps to be easy. Yeah. <laughs> right, we don't need to listen to my stupid voice. By about rep three or four, these reps should be get, should be difficult. You shouldn't be walk, it shouldn't be a breeze. Like this guy in the back. So it's about three reps. This is when it's going to start to suck. You want this, You want it to suck. You want most of the repetition to suck. Now he's moving as fast as he can right now. He's not trying to move slow. Usually, if the load is adequate, you're gonna you're gonna be forced to move slow. You cannot lift a heavy weight quickly. Have you ever tried? Go try. He's he's trying to move that weight as fast as he can. In fact, a lot of times when I'm training someone, I'll tell them to move it fast because you can't. But they'll end up contracting harder. Now he's emptying the tank when you get to this position you want to leave absolutely nothing left you want to empty the tank as much as you can without throwing up or passing out and then at the end of the set lower slowly do not just drop the wet the weight the termination of the set is also part of the workout cool so those are a couple exercises. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, let me see. Missed the part. This is just one or two sets. One set is all that is required if you do it like that. Sometimes 
especially if you're a beginner, you're probably going to want to do two sets. You're probably not going to quite get the amount of inroad and stimulus in one set as you could. But over time, as you get better at this, you're going to notice you can't even do two sets. So what I tell a lot of people to do is, you know, if you get finished with that set and you feel like you didn't quite destroy that muscle group, do another set immediately. Or, you know, wait like 10 seconds. Um, one set is all that is needed if you do it properly. But if you're doing sets like most traditional gym goers, like the guy in the back, like let's bring that up again. I didn't mean to catch him. I know I normally pretty good at not catching anybody in the back, but whatever. I'll probably take this stream down. Probably watches my channel anyway. And if you do watch my channel, I'm not making fun of you. I'm just, you know, saying that's just not the right way to perform a set. All right. So let's, you know, if you do a set like this guy in the back, you're going to need more of them. These are not difficult. Two, three, four. The first four reps are nothing. Okay, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, by the way. Let's see how much time it takes him to complete this high volume set. All right, so Phil's set is almost two minutes long. Phil's set is about a minute and 40 seconds of constant time under load. Let's see how long this guy's set is in the back. So we're talking about volume, right? So traditional gym goers, this is how long your set is. Nineteen seconds. Okay. His one set was nineteen seconds. This one set was a minute and forty seconds. This one set was five times four or five times longer. We are doing four times the volume in one set as the average gym goer is doing. So he's going to need to do four sets to accumulate enough time under load and enough inroad to stimulate something. Why would you do four 20 second sets like sloppy shit when you could do one set that lasts a minute and 40 seconds or a minute and 30 seconds, 90 seconds. So it'll take him four sets to do 80 seconds of time under load. We did 90 seconds of time under load in one. We actually did about 100 seconds of time under load. <laughs> so we do more volume in one set as the average gym goer does in four or five. This isn't a low volume workout. This is a high efficiency workout. Volume is not sets and reps. How could it be? How could volume be sets and reps when you got this guy doing sets and reps like this and this guy doing sets and reps like that? If he, if my client and the guy in the back both did eight reps, I think he did do about eight reps. My client probably did about six to eight reps, okay? This guy in the back also did six to eight reps. Would you say these two exercises are equally exhausting? No, dude. This is why volume is not sets and reps because sets – and reps are performed differently. He does about 10 seconds to complete a rep. He does one or two seconds to complete a rep. So you cannot say volume is sets and reps because look at the huge difference between how a set and a rep is performed. Everything you need to know about high-intensity training is in this video right now. What the guy's doing in the back is what most gym goers are doing. Short, sloppy, 
low intensity sets, but a lot of them to potentially reach that stimulus threshold. What me and my client are doing is high efficiency, high intensity, slow repetition cadence so we don't bang and blast out our biceps tendons. How is How does this not make perfect sense? I, I, I can't wrap my head around how someone does not see these two and automatically see which one is more effective and time efficient. And I wasn't even showing the whole thing. <laughs> anyway. Oh, VIP girls chat. Mm, no. <laughs> I don't love spam. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's just bring that video back up. I was just explaining something and I didn't even have it up. And because I'm an asshole. And that's what I do sometimes. All right, let's see. We're going to do it again. All right, we're going to time how long the guy in the back does his set. Okay, ready? All right. We're going to count how long. So Phil, so his set is about, my client set is about a minute and 40 something seconds or a minute 40, which is about a hundred seconds, 90 seconds, whatever. Um, it's about, yeah, 80, 90 seconds. So we're going to see how long the guy in the back, his set, two, three, four. Actually, let's start from the beginning. Let me get my stopwatch out. We're going to time this. So the guy in the back is a traditional gym goer. High volume. High intensity training. Does it work? Blah, 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 blah. Look at the fuck this guy's doing. All right. We're going to time his set. Ready? And we're going to compare. This is why volume is not sets and reps. Look at the difference how a guy is performing a set in the rep and a rep in the back. And the difference between how my client is performing a set and rep. Volume cannot be measured as sets and reps unless you're controlling how a set and a fucking rep is performed. Oh, so frustrating. All right, let's watch. Ah, wait, I was off. So that guy's done about six reps, seven reps for my clients, two. Twenty-two seconds, that guy's entire set. That guy does one set for 22 seconds. Here we're doing one set for a minute and... Forty-five. So if you were to say, we both did one set, which set do you think is more effective in terms of stimulating growth? My client's set or this guy in the back? Watch the guy in the back. Which one do you think? Look at his face. Look at the guy in the back. Which set do you think is more effective at stimulating growth? This guy in the back in the hat? Or this guy in the row? Let me know in the comments. What this guy is doing? This? Volume is not sets and reps. Volume is time under meaningful load. This guy in the back had about, let's see, the first couple reps were pointless. So his, his time under actual meaningful load, well, these first couple are pointless. This is not meaningful load. Ready? That is pointless. That is pointless. That is pointless. All right, here we go. Now it's going to be meaningful load. Now he's actually kind of working here. So let's see how much time under actual meaningful load this guy in the back has.
15 seconds. We've got a minute 45 time on our main flow here. This is why volume is not sets and reps. All right. You tell me which which one you think is more effective. What this guy's doing in the back, or my clients doing? Come on. Don't take a genius to figure that out. All right. So we did it again. <laughs> my reps are 19 seconds. Exactly. Most of the people in the gym, their entire set is faster than our one, one rep. Whole set is 45 seconds because I do have your sets. You can do that. But the other guy is also cheating using momentum. Yep. I have a problem spending over 60 seconds under tension, especially for a lower body. That's fine. You don't need to be 90 seconds. Just anywhere from like, I don't know, I would say like 45 to 120 seconds is fine. All right, let's see. I enjoy hip, but I love to add weight every workout using one set to failure. Isn't it dangerous or okay as long as I move slowly? Everything is okay as long as you move slowly, as long as you move slowly. It doesn't make sense to just randomly add weight with every workout. Um, that's some like fucking renaissance or whatever. Who's my kids are talking? Renaissance periodization fucking bullshit. <laughs> just add weight just because. <laughs> so stupid. Guys, does it make sense to just add weight just because? It's like, it's so moronic to me that I just, I don't understand why people think this is effective. It's just so obvious. All right, let's see. Just when I thought I did enough, I realized, shoot, I didn't work hard enough. So then did another set at a heavier weight. Exactly. So if you get to the point where you finish the set and you're like, nah, I don't know. I don't really feel like I got it. Do another. The goal is not to do sets. The goal is deeply and aggressively feet, uh, fatigue the targeted muscle group or targeted muscle area. Let's see. Does it then make sense to get sore for a day or two after doing hit? Most of the time, if you're going to get sore, you're going to feel the most soreness on the second day. Why? No clue. You generally don't feel that sore the, the day you do the workout. You feel a little sore the day after the workout. You feel the most sore the second day after the workout. Don't know why. Do you have any training theories that have yet to be proven, disproven by studies? Um, yeah, explosive training. <laughs> explosive training is moronic. Um, there's, there's, Evidence that suggests that abruptly loading tendons will increase your speed. But you do not need to abruptly load your tendons in the weight room. You, you will be abruptly loading your tendons practicing your sport and increase, increasing your speed. Trying to increase your speed in the weight room is the dumbest, dumbest thing you could ever do. Because you're using high amounts of load, producing high peak forces, and drastically shooting up your chance of injury. You should be increasing your speed with your skill on the field or on the court or on the sand or on the whatever. <clears throat> do you have examples of leg exercises using this method? I do. You want to see? Lorand, you must be new. Go to goldenerasystem.com. Get my golden era system, and there are several leg exercises, leg press, squat, leg extension, um, heel raise, leg curl, deadlift, anything you can think of. Split squat, lunge in the hit session, and the hit workout. I have a ton of leg exercises in that system. Go to goldenerasystem.com, and there's a bunch of them. Um, here's a hip belt squat that we did. You know, just something different. All right. So again, 
you know, he wasn't familiar with this piece of equipment, so it's going to be a little sloppier than it should have been. Again, you got to practice usually, but whatever. We just went for it. I kind of like this machine. Parallel or slightly below. You don't really ever need to go ask the grass. Avoid full lockout. Slow and controlled. His form does break down a little bit, mostly because he's just not used to this machine. You need more practice. His he, We uh, did triceps after this, and he had to take 15 minutes just to catch his breath before doing triceps. And we did one set on this. And watch, he, he, he couldn't walk after. This is how you train legs. This is downright brutal, honestly. This thing's nuts. I hear my neighbor clapping, so <laughs> football's on. <laughs> Here we go. I'm giving him a little assistance, just kind of guiding him through because his form's going to start breaking down a little bit. He doesn't even go to failure. We stopped just short of failure. I didn't take him to failure on this because it's not used to the machine. That belt should be a little bit lower too, but whatever. We're going to go one more here. Absolutely fucking brutal. Actually, I have him hold it, hold it, hold it, inroad a little more, and lock out. A yeah. little on the sloppy side, but it got the job done. But watch him try to stand up after this. We didn't even go to failure on this. Watch him try to stand up. Oh, shit. My bad. Hold on. Watch his legs after one set. Look at him shake. He, can't, he couldn't even stand up. <laughs> we did one set. I'm telling you guys, if you're not training this way, you are, God, you are missing out. All right, wouldn't time static contraction exercises be inclined to generate more of a neuromuscular efficiency adaptation rather than muscle size as a type of adaptation? No, it's actually the opposite. Well-controlled research measures strength improvements with static isometric um, like force production. They use like uh, dynamometers to measure how much force your muscles produce in. It's actually the opposite of this. Um, anything that involves movement is going to have a more neuromuscular adaptation. Uh, time static contraction, no. The minute I do six reps, I immediately add weight. I would do no. I would if you're if you're uh, doing heavy weight, short time under load. I can guarantee your reps. Very sloppy. I just, you know, I have a, you know, you can send me some videos if you want um, through Instagram or whatever of your training, but I would imagine there's a lot to be corrected on your form if you're if you're doing six reps and adding weight all the time. It's probably sloppy. All right, let's see. When aiming to lose body fat, would it help to prioritize fat loss by changing to a once a week minimalist routine like the big three? Yeah. I would think exercise more often would increase appetite. Correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't believe in anything minimalist when it comes to exercise because Minimalist versus optimal is like a few extra minutes, honestly. You know, if, if if you only have five fucking minutes to work out a week, man, you you gotta rearrange some stuff in your life. Um, I got a question about this yesterday. I would avoid minimalist routines because an optimum routine is not going to take much longer than a minimalist. Mm. 
Mm. All right. Is it necessary to do an arm curl exercise after going to failure on a vertical ball and horizontal row? Um, according to the literature I posted on Instagram like a couple weeks ago, both with trained and untrained subject, subjects, adding a single joint movement to multi-joint movements provided no additional growth and strength improvements in the biceps. All right. I'll, I'll show you. All right. I'll show you. Uh, Chrome dev. Wow. Okay. All right. Gentle considered the addition of single joint exercises to a multi joint resistance training program. Participants were divided into multi joint or multi joint plus single joint groups in which they performed either bench press and lat pull down or bench press, lat pull down, triceps extension, biceps curl. Okay, for three sets of eight to 12 repetitions twice a week for 10 weeks. All of the sets were performed to concentric failure. Muscle thickness of the elbow flexors, biceps, was measured using ultrasound, revealing significant increases in hypertrophy for both the multi-joint only group and the multi-joint plus single joint group with no significant difference between groups. So according to this, you know, they did, they did three sets. They didn't even need to do three sets, but they did concentric failure twice a week, 10, uh, 10 weeks. The addition of a biceps curl resulted in no significant difference in biceps growth if you're only doing a pull down. So what do I recommend? Honestly, lately over the last six months to a year, when I add a biceps exercise into my workout, I feel overtrained. So I started cutting them out. You can probably add one. Go ahead and add one. It's just probably not going to make a difference. If you like doing them, do it. It's probably not going to make a difference. And this is the thing with, you know, the whole fitness community. A lot of people are doing things that they don't necessarily need to in fear that if they don't do them, the results are going to be worse. But in many cases, it doesn't even make a difference. All right. So with the shoulder press method, which machine should we use? Any selectorized, pin selectorized mach shoulder machine. Anyone. Or let's see. When I use the hammer strength plate loaded leg press, I was at pain in my knees on the life fitness leg press. I don't feel any pain. Is this a 45 degree leg press? Because that's probably why you're getting pain. Um, I'll show you. 45 degree leg press. These are the worst fucking leg presses I've ever made. I hate them. Hate them. If you're using this leg press, this is probably why you have pain in your knees. So, if this is the leg press you're using... Actually, no, that's the wrong one. If any of these 45-degree leg presses are the one you're using, that's why you have pain in your knees and just don't use it. They just, they suck. All right. Do you ever encourage the use of not-to-failure workouts between high-intensity sessions? Darden talked about them and how he believes it helped may facilitate recovery. Yeah, it. so Darden found, no, actually Darden found that doing a not to fail your workout in between training makes the soreness and everything worse. It, it, not to fail your workouts in between training will prolong recovery. It will make it take longer. What he did find, though, is doing an equally intense workout reduced soreness. 
you know, do do what you want with that information. I mean, if you have a soreness that is so intolerable you can't stand it, then go do an equally hard workout. It'll probably go away, but it's not going to help you recover faster because soreness doesn't really have anything to do with your recovery ability. All right. Shoulder press in the video you showed had two different grip positions. Is a neutral grip better for joint health? Um, I would recommend neutral grip for everything. The other grip on most of them are going to be, you know, externally rotated like this. You don't want these grips. But the Nautilus Nitro is so well designed, the handles are like this, actually. They're, they're more in front. They're not way back here. They're more in front and they're angled. So with that machine, I own that machine. I have owned that machine for several years, and I've been using that those grips always because it keeps the shoulder open. But for most overhead press machines, neutral grip is, is what you're going to want to do. <clears throat> that the first time he's doing his exercise, form is good. Yeah, um, you know he was a football player. He he knows what he's you know he's coordinated. Volume trainers can't touch this level of intensity. No, nope. no, they will not. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it, it makes complete sense why most people can't conceptualize high intensity one or two sets to failure twice a week because they've never tried it. They've never actually gone through it. Um, once you go through it, there's no going back. You couldn't possibly go back to a high volume, lower intensity workout and feel that you're doing it correctly. <laughs> so most people just need to go through one of these workouts and then the light bulb will go off. They'll be like, oh shit, this makes sense. And they'll never go back. You couldn't possibly, you would just feel like you're wasting your time. You would. All right. The hammer strength leg press I use where I have pain in my knees is the one that works on a pivot point. All right. Let me look these up. We'll figure this out. Strength leg press. Let's see. We're going to go. Oh, is it this one? I'll share the screen. Let me know in the comments if this is the one. If that's giving you pain in your knees, I'm surprised. This is one of the best leg press I've ever used in my life. I love this one. This one is. It sucks. This one's good. Is this the one? Burke? Whenever you get a second, let me know. I'll just leave it up. If this is the leg press you're using, I don't know. Because th this is just a very, very, very good leg press. Again, you don't want to use any of these stupid... I don't know why Hammer Strength makes them. These bilateral machines. Oh, my God. How stupid. Even the Nautilus Duo, stupid. You want it like this. You want unilateral, always. Burke, yes, it's that leg press. <sighs> I don't know. Um, are you locking out? What I would say is just use a leg press that doesn't hurt your knees. I mean, obviously. Um, but this leg press is awesome. This thing is nasty. Um, but if you're using a life fitness one that looks more like this and it doesn't hurt your knees, use this one. It's fine. I mean, you're going to get the same results. What the hell is that? These are good, too. I like these. Um, I like these. The, the only thing I don't like about these is it's getting in and out, you know, the starting and stopping position. But yeah, I love these. These are great. These sidebacks. Like presses. These are nice. Cybex makes some good equipment, but they also make some bad equipment. This is the like press I use my entire life in my gym. Old ass thing. These are good too. Um, but all these Cybex VR whatevers, VR3, these are good. Decent. Uh, Matrix and everything is just, just blech, horrible. All right. Do your workout plans. To suit home gyms that train at home, yes, they absolutely suit home gyms. In fact, if you're training at home um, in my VIP coaching group, you know, 
I'll take you through your workout weekly, virtually on camera. Um, we've been doing that lately. So if you want to optimize your, your home workout, yeah, Golden Era System has every exercise that you can do at home. Plus, it comes with the home workout for free, which has like 25 other videos of exercises you can do at home. So definitely. All right, let's see. You made a video against bench pressing, but the chest press machine at my gym is not very good. It's a dumbbell bench instead of a barbell and okay alternative. Uh, I don't know. The bench press is okay. It's not horrible. Just if you're going to do a bench press, you just don't want to go down all the way where the bar touches your chest because it'll fuck your shoulders up. Um, you don't want to lock out. It, between bench press and barbell, it would literally be preference. All right. Is it okay to train upper body while still recovering from a leg workout some days ago? Um, yeah. I mean, it, you know, if you did your leg workout and it's been two days, you're probably fine. That's normally what I do. I'll do an upper body workout, wait like three, and then hit the legs. What are your opinions about seated hammer curl exercises instead of standing? They're just as good. Doesn't matter. I like doing them both. If you could only do two exercises at home, one upper body, one lower body, what would they be? Um, it would be a chin-up and a squat. All right. Isn't hit too mentally draining? Sometimes you just don't feel like pushing yourself so hard. Well, if you if there's a day where you don't feel like pushing yourself hard, don't go. So that's what I tell my clients. If you're having a day where you're just like, I just don't feel like doing this, and you can't push yourself hard, well, your workout is going to be less effective if you don't push yourself hard. So if there's a day where, for one reason or another, you're tired, your wife pissed you off, your children, I don't know, shit the bed, and you're just having a day where you're just, you're just stressed out, and you don't feel like you'll be able to push yourself hard, go tomorrow. Just don't go. It's fine. You're not going to lose all your gains in 24 hours. <laughs> just skip it. Skip it. Doesn't the dumbbell... Bench press stimulate chest as elbows abduction occur. Yeah, but abduction, ad, adduction, humeral adduction occurs, but you don't get any resistance since the dumbbell, since the dumbbell is here, right? Resistance is based on the moment arm. The moment arm is here. The distance between my chest and the load, the distance, the moment arm, right? As I come up and I adduct, look at the moment arm. The moment arm is zero. So although I am adducting my arm, I'm adducting with no moment arm and no tension on the muscle. Pointless. If you're using something like a cable or a converging chest press, you're going to adduct with load. But if you're using a dumbbell and you're only getting resistance downward, you're going to have no moment arm in the extended position. You're not even going to be loading the muscle. This is where the bench press is actually better because when you're bench pressing, you actually still have a moment arm because you're not adducting and you're keeping tension on the chest. So that's where the bench press is actually a little bit better than a dumbbell press. A dumbbell press isn't a very good exercise. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not. It's just not very good. That cable chest press is good. I like that one because you're getting tension. Um, yeah, the moment arm is changing. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. All right, I'm going to wrap it up in a couple minutes. Remember, guys, the home workout completely free forever, 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 forever with the Golden Era System. Go to goldenerasystem.com where I demonstrate all the exercises you saw today in full detail. Um, also the hit home workout is going to have a lot of other exercises that you can do with minimal to sometimes no equipment at all.
All right, let's see. This is a good question. Is it possible that after two or three days you feel strong enough to do a workout, but that your muscles are not fully recovered? If you feel strong enough to do a full workout with the same intensity as the workout you did before, you are recovered. You may not have optimized the growth yet, but you're recovered. A good indication, a good indication you're not recovered is a reduction in strength. If you're not, if you do a workout two, three days later, you're not strong. You have a reduction in strength, a reduction in performance. You're not recovered. That's an indication. Do you do quad um, adductor abductor machine? Oh, uh, that's for the glutes. I don't do an abductor machine for the glutes, but it's a good exercise. I just don't do them because my glutes are huge. And even they're fine. How about doing a converging chest press with dumbbells? Right. The, the, the problem is when you converge with the dumbbells, you don't get any resistance in the converged position. That's, that's why they suck. All right, let's see. On the bench press, I always hear about scapular retraction and depression is necessary part of form. Is that true? Yes, that is true. You do want to depress your shoulders and retract your scapula. This will recruit the muscles in your chest better. If you elevate your shoulders and not contract your scapula, you're going to be using anterior deltoid more. Yes, this is correct and true. All right, why would time static contractions? Drew Bay suggests holding for a few seconds with less than max contraction and then gradually gradually reach peak contraction. Uh, that's the way I have people do it. Um, it's going to recruit slow, intermediate, and then later high-order motor units more effectively that way. And it's going to allow you to maintain better form. That might be why. Can I do chest press machine Monday and Friday? Yeah, sure, probably. That's that's really not enough <laughs> information to give you a good answer. All right, guys, that's it for me. Um, I'm going to hop off here. Like, subscribe. I'll leave this one up so you guys can go back and watch that uh, shoulder thing. But I'm probably not going to leave this live stream up very long because one of my clients is on it. And I don't know if he wants anybody watching him. So um, I just wanted to do it live to show you. But I'm probably only going to leave this up for a day. I will upload that advanced shoulder technique and a tech, advanced shoulder technique for the biceps and advanced shoulder technique for the quads and advanced advanced shoulder technique for the quads. Advanced technique for the quads, advanced technique for the biceps, advanced for the triceps along with the shoulders, advanced for the chest. I'll put those in the golden era system. Um, but this I'm only going to leave up for a day just to maintain privacy of um, my client. Um, all right. Another Drew Bay collab. Yes, we're going to be doing an in-gym workout at some point when our schedules allow it. He lives about an hour and a half from me, so we got to kind of figure out how we're going to do it. But we're going to be in the gym film start to finish. Whew. All right, guys, I'm pooped. Um, go ahead, goldenairsystem.com, home workout for free. You get two workout plans for the price of one. Go ahead and get it. I'm telling you, if you haven't tried training like this, try that Golden Era system, incorporate those exercises into your workout. You will see way better results from anything you've ever done. And as evidence, we compared what most people are doing compared to me putting one of my clients through a workout. If the difference isn't completely obvious to you, then I don't know what else to tell you. All right. All right. See you later, guys. Like, subscribe, share, blah, 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 blah. And um, I got a video coming hopefully this week if the editors can get it, get it done. I'm going over the literature and the research and explaining what it means. All right. All right. See you later, guys.